Medical Student Association uh, in a, a psychiatry group interest for the invitation, as well as my friend Samuel Montplaisir. Um, it is indeed a rare opportunity in the academia to benefit from uh, an interdisciplinary setting such as this one. And I look forward to your reactions, questions, and comments on that topic. On this matter, I'm also pretty curious on what you might think of a topic such as today's. I want to begin by um, reassuring all of you, um, because um, be certain that I am well aware that any attempt to use Freud's psychoanalytical methods in a contemporary setting that is not treating it uh, from a strictly historical nor critical perspective uh, in view of its eventual overcoming is so full of red flags, it must look like Russia in 1917. So the media views of psychoanalysts perpetrated over the patients through, throughout the 20th century, Freud himself being the first, uh, therapists completely making up past traumas and convincing their patients they had been abused by their parents when it was not the case, the ridiculous misogyny and racism of their old approach are all reasons for which we should be skeptical of any attempt at rescuing these ideas. So why on earth would one want to go back to Freudian psychoanalysis? Um, first, it must be noted that I am no clinician, but a philosopher. As such, I treat Freud not as a clinical tool, but rather as an interpretive method that aims at better understanding the world we live in. Furthermore, I don't use Freud's interpretive methods per se, but rather the, recup the recuperation by German philosopher Theodor Adorno. Adorno himself was well aware, as soon as the 40s, of the shortcomings of psychoanalysis and of its oppressive violent outcomes, which he often explicitly thematized in his works. Nevertheless, uh, uh, Adorno strongly believed, as a sociologist, that psychoanalysis gave us useful tools to better understand how the objective structuration of late capitalism and its ideology affected humans being subjectively, by this psych that is psychologically. As such, I aim at demonstrating how Adorno's recuperation of Freud's insights allow us, allows us rich and potent interpretation of society in a way which shows to be productive, especially compared to other sociological approaches of the real. Today, I will take a rather curious starting point. One of the strangest cases of the history of psychoanalysis, that is the case of Daniel Paul Schreber. Considered by Freud as an exemplary case of paranoid narcissism, I would show how the neurosis afflicting Schreber were in fact the expression of objective social contradictions affecting Western societies on a grand scale. In other words, Schreber's symptoms were not those of a sick individual, but rather those of a sick society. First, I will say a few words on Schreber, whom, while being known in the clinical world, nevertheless remains a forgotten figure. From this biographical sketch, we will be able to expose the social etiology of paranoid narcissism. We will explore the concrete consequences of this pathology and how it expresses itself at a collective level in our contemporary social setting. From this, we will come to understand how Schreber's case is but the prophetic mirror image of our own contemporary neurosis. Daniel Paul Schreber, born in 1842 in Leipzig, was a lawyer and a highly respected judge in his community, known for his vivacious intelligence and white culture by his family and relatives. In 1894, he suffered from a nervous breakdown, mainly due to a work-related burnout, from which he will recover rapidly. In 1893, however, another breakdown, worse this time, will afflict him in a serious way. From this moment, he will start suffering from the acute paranoid deliriums that made him famous. Schreber will first complain of having ideas of an hypochondriac nature. He claims that he suffers from a softening of the brain, that he is on the verge of dying while no physiological signs suggest so. Follows an hyperstasia crisis accompanied by morbid thoughts. He thinks he's dead, already decomposing, plagued and undead. Tormented to the extreme, 
he attempts at his own life multiple times, attempting to drown himself in his bath, asking for the cyanide due to him. Yet the worst is yet to come. Later, he will suffer from hallucinations and from the pers persecution complex. He's convinced that the world is on the verge of the apocalypse. In his eschatological delirium, he believed to be chosen by superior forces to become a woman who would give birth to a new Aryan race, uh oh, <laughs> superior to the previous human race. Jealous of his nervous connection with the cosmos, in part because of his ability to defecate, uh, the greatest pleasure of all, claims Schreber, God himself will persecute him through his therapist, Professor Fletchig, whom he calls a soul assassin. It is but a minuscule parcel of his madness, I spare you many details. I strongly invite you to read his memoirs, though. They are fascinating. Um, surprisingly, between the onset of the, this crisis and the moment Schreber risks to be interned to the asylum for the rest of his days, he will strangely recover the totality of his sane ways. What is especially strange is that he will not, however, give up his delirious ideas. In fact, he will develop them to such a point that he conceives of a whole metaphysical system, complex and elaborated, some kind of cosmology with a whole hierarchy of divine creatures inhabiting his hallucinations. On this point, I quote a passage uh, from Freud's reading of the Schreber case that you will see on the screen. Since the beginning of his initial crisis, Schreber, on the one hand, had developed an, in an ingenious delusional structure, while on the other hand, his personality had been reconstructed and now showed itself, except for a few isolated, isolated disturbances, capable of meeting the demands of everyday life. Hence, at this stage, Schreber is functional and looks normal. His therapist in 1900, Dr. Guido Weber, says that in social settings, he shows a keen interest and deep knowledge for every social, political, and cultural topics, displaying an excellent memory in a sane judgment in ethical matters. He is polite and tactful with others. However, regarding his delusions, not only does he not hide having some, he gladly answers any questions asked him of that matter, he willingly claims and defends them. When he will be forced to hold a trial to demonstrate that he's sufficiently sane to avoid forced internment, he will defend that his delusions are akin to a personal religious life, a life which, according to him, was absolutely harmless even regarding the actions these delusions obliged him to perform. He won his case in 1902, followed quiet years with his wife and his adopted daughter until his wife died due to a stroke. Schreber then fell ill again and was inca incapacitated for the rest of his life. What is fascinating about Schreber's case is the apparent clear-sightedness with which he came to understand his own condition, a lucidity which nonetheless didn't prevent him from maintaining his delusional system of beliefs. Moreover, the consolidation of his morbid ideas into a complete theological system, far from worsening his health, allowed him to get better and to remain functional, alternating between a socially acceptable set of beliefs and acute delusions. But how could these two systems of beliefs not only cohabit within Schreber's psyche, but also guarantee his normal social functioning? Actually, this aspect of Schreber's neurosis is, historically speaking, quite common among individuals considered cultivated. Those who, like Schreber, are part of a certain social economical elite. Max Horkheimer, Adorno's colleague, pointed this out in his essay on the problem of truth. Auguste Comte was fascinated by doctrines of the beyond. William James, the psychologist, was into mysticism. Hans Driesch was both into scientism and overt occultism. Think of our elite today, Kanye West, Elon Musk. Okay, these guys ain't no Isaac Newton, but still. The persistence of irrational beliefs in the supernatural, in the occult, or delusional ideas at our supposed age of disenchantment and reason, especially in high circles of society where rich people like 
Tom Cruise participate in Scientology, or university professors strongly adhere to conspiracy theories, force us to question the relationship between culture and neurosis. More specifically, the extreme character of the Schreber case, whom, beyond any system of pre-established beliefs, created from scratch a whole new system in order to save his own psyche, lets us to believe that this psychic mechanism plays a far more rational role than we might expect. Adorno's hypothesis is that this neurotic persistence is due to the failure of culture itself. And if Schreber's education in culture failed to preserve him from madness, it is neither due to a personal insufficiency nor contingencies. It is the logical result of culture itself. But what does it mean for culture to fail? To answer this question, we now turn to Adorno's psychoanalytical reading of culture. While it encompasses traditional institutions of education, pedagogical doctrines, as well as cultural objects and practices, I use the word culture to designate something more fundamental than all of these things, something akin to what we will call socialization. That is the process by which a new human being is molded to fit in her society. At a more sociological level, German philosopher Hegel conceived of culture as the process of enculturation of the world and humanity itself, sort of work in progress elevating humanity out of animality towards eventually rational self-determination and freedom. One might conceive of culture and education as some sort of bargain between an individual and his society. One puts aside one's immediate subjective, animal-like, egotistical needs and ideas with the promise that his participation to a project bigger than himself in which he will actively participate will allow him a greater satisfaction of his needs and an increased freedom, both individually and collectively. This promise of culture and civilization is one of the main themes of Freud's theory. Long-term investment of energy in socially sanctioned projects instead of a more immediate but more restrained satisfaction of egotistical desires should be rewarding. To rephrase it, by accepting the rules of my society, I should benefit from its resources. We expect from me that I don't kill my neighbor because I just feel like it. And in exchange, I should have a better life than if I was alone, naked in the woods, hunting for my food. However, when this investment of energy in so social activities reveals itself to be unfruitful at a moment where the individual expects a profitable return on his investment, he withdraws, so to speak, his investment in order to eventually reinvest it somewhere else in other activities. Yet what happens when an individual is incapable of reinvesting this energy in a socially acceptable way? This energy, uh, by the way, is what Freud calls the libido. So when the individual is stuck with uh, what we call a libidinal surplus, incapable of actualizing himself through socially acceptable means, he takes back his energy within himself. All of his thoughts, desires, and whole being is suddenly turned inwards, so to speak. This situation is of libidinal imbalance is what Freud calls narcissism. Now, generally, we conceive of a narcissist as someone infatuated with himself and not really caring about others exactly like Ovid's Narcisse. For Freud, however, narcissism is not an easy situation at all. Indeed, we learn from a very young age that we absolutely must invest libid libidinally something other than ourselves, that we are expected to realize ourselves through socially acceptable means of expression. Hence, for narcissists, this libidinal surplus in itself is lived like a failure to adapt to society, to invest it adequately. It follows that when an individual is incapable of self-actualizing himself in a society, he spontaneously blames himself for his failure. Even more, 
He feels like it disappointed his entire society. This feeling made even stronger by, uh, because of the libido surplus, which is focused on the individual instead of external objects and tasks, heightens self-awareness. This over-consciousness of the self, coupled with the feeling of disappointing social peers, leads directly to the first step of what we call paranoia, which Freud calls the delusion of persecution. The strikingly prominent feature in the causation of paranoia, says Freud, are first social humiliations and slights. Paranoid patients who are unable to, uh, to understand what they are doing wrong and why they are incapable of self-actualizing themselves in a society come to think that unknown forces would have access to their thoughts and would persecute them. This, Freud says, contains a kernel of truth. A power of this kind, watching, discovering, and criticizing all our intentions does really exist. Indeed, it exists in every one of us in normal life. This is our moral conscience, gauging from the inside the discrepancy between the individual and his ideal of, a, of success, blaming himself for this discrepancy. We know that Schreber's crises were triggered by burnouts, trying to answer social demands in his work. Moreover, knowing that Schreber was incapable of having children was sterile, the frustration caused by the incapacity to have a family must have heightened his sense of, a so of social failure in an era where to be masculine in the eye of society essentially implied to be a father. This in turn explained why he started to believe he was slowly, literally transforming into a woman, what he considered to be unmasculine, according to his own criterion. Schreber was libidinally investing his world with no positive return from this investment, thus took back this energy within himself triggering the narcissism that led to his paranoia. This feeling of persecution, as we might guess, is untenable in the long term. This is the moment where the ima imagination comes into play. Indeed, the imagination attempts to find ex explanation by itself. Since there is nothing out there in the concrete world that might help, because the self failed to invest this world successfully to find answers in the real world, imagination coupled with persecution becomes hallucinations. Through explanatory theories, the psyche attempts to heal itself and tries to find a way to explain why it cannot invest the world in order to eventually reinvest this world successfully. A common trait in paranoid patients like Schreber is the construction of apocalyptic narratives implying universal catastrophes, which are a direct result of their incapacity to libidinally invest their world. I quote Freud on uh, Schreber's eschatological uh, narrative here at the screen. The patient has libidinally withdrawn from the people in his environment and from the external world. Everything has become indifferent and irrelevant to him. The end of the world is the projection of this internal catastrophe. His subjective world has come to an end since his withdrawal of his love from it, that is, his withdrawal of energy. Another defense mechanism typical of paranoia is projection. The psyche attempts to blame a third party other than itself to alleviate the anguish. One or many hidden instances would be responsible for his persecution and failure. At the peak of his madness, Schreber came to believe that God himself was torturing him. The patient turns toward su supernatural forces, occult forces would be at work in this world, beyond rationality and empirical facts. A demonic, disruptive agent, one who would threaten my success would be at, uh, at work. This incapacity to achieve social success is not due to himself. The game is rigged. An external agent cheats and takes what is due to me. This is also in this context that paranoia transformed narcissism in its most famous form, that is megalomania. Uh, 
the breadth of my persecution is proportional to my greatness. Schreber came to believe that if God himself persecuted him personally, certainly it was because of his existence was of the utmost matter. His grandiosity calls for jealousy from insidious forces which wants to steal his thunder by cheating. Of course, these explanations are unreasonable and unverifiable, but precisely because reasonable and verifiable ways of realizing oneself in the status quo have failed to make him happy. So paranoia aims at healing through the imagination in order to preserve the psyche at any cost. For Schreber, the humiliation of being transformed into a woman and tortured by God suddenly became the greatest of honors. The order of the universe against God himself chose Schreber to give birth to a new, better human race. Not only did this narrative allow Schreber to believe he was behaving adequately in this world, but it helped explain his suffering as the means towards the birth of a new and better world. Schreber's delusions transformed themselves in a teleology where the status quo, as painful it might be, was compliant to some cosmological order that would bring down his redemption. Everything for him had a meaning again. From this moment in his delusions, Schreber found the strength to come back towards the world and start behaving normally again. From what has been said, we understand that Schreber's paranoid symptoms are actually attempts of the psyche to heal itself rather than the sickness per se. But what is the cause of the sickness? To what threat answers Schreber's paranoia? We've seen how the failure at adapting to society's ideals triggers such anguish. But why would it trigger such things within socially successful people? Why are the rich, famous, and cultivated prone to such paranoia when they are well served by their social setting? For Adorno, this is to be explained by the failure of Western culture itself. We must conceive of our everyday notion of culture as the subjective, intellectual, conceptual counterpart of this process. As such, um, scientific knowledge, as well as cultural objects and practices, would be the intellectual expression of some concrete human needs and problems and their solutions given at specific historical periods. Culture and education will allow individuals to educate themselves to join their current day society and participate to the concrete progress of society itself towards freedom and happiness. This implies that culture is always historically situated and constantly changing. When cultural objects, knowledges, aren't allowing an individual and society to actualize themselves anymore when it doesn't allow them to solve their concrete problems, they ideally give their way into new cultural objects, new knowledge. Yet for Dorno, something happened around the last great bourgeois revolutions in history. At the time of these revolutions, for example, the French Revolution, the bourgeoisie grounded its power in its material and concrete social situation. It had the money and the means of production to overthrow feudalism. Its ideals and cultural objects were the subjective and intellectual expression of this material status. While the ideals the bourgeoisie aimed at universal, uh, while the ideals the bourgeoisie aimed at uh, were universal human emancipation through culture, the effectiveness of it came from its material grounding. Eventually, the bourgeoisie, Adorno says, came to a contradiction. The 19th century came up against the limit of bourgeois society, which could not fulfill its own reason its own ideals of freedom, justice, and humane immediacy without running the risk of its order being abolished. They could not promise emancipation for the poor without sacrificing their own economical privilege. To maintain itself, a bourgeois society falsely claimed to have achieved universal emancipation even when it failed. 
this society started to present its intellectual culture as guaranteeing freedom for anybody possessing this culture, while in fact, it could only guarantee freedom to those possessing the material privileges tied to this culture. And bourgeois culture and education started to defend the hope false from the beginning that culture will be able to achieve for people what reality denies them. Go to the opera, read Shakespeare, you'll become a better human being. Adopt the work hard ethics and you'll achieve the American dream. Make your baby listen to Mozart, he'll be more intelligent, even though he's malnourished and living in a violent neighborhood. At this moment, we started to fetishize cultural goods and ideals for themselves, independent from the concrete reality they emerge from. Culture became an absolute, an abstract absolute, full of ideals of what being successful means that bear no ties to our actual material situation. Conversely, education is now seen as a pure means of adaptation to the pro productive ideals of this culture. That is, the aim of education is to find a job. We are born and raised to work in a culturally dead world, which in no way helps us, helps us to understand and master our present day reality. While the proletarians were the first to be fooled by this promise, it soon got back to the elite also. I quote Adorno from his work, Minima Moralia. For while bourgeois forms of existence are truculently conserved, that is, bourgeois culture, their economic precondition has fallen away. The world has changed. Privacy has given way entirely to the privation it always secretly was. To it is now mingled fury at being no longer able to perceive that things might be different and better. Therefore, individuals are called from an early age to restrain their individual impulses to invest a fetishized and dead culture without any actuality nor truth. This is how culture fails at the psychic needs of individuals. Our culture is totally disconnected from our current day social material needs and reality. Supposedly cultivated and successful individuals, when they attain the maximum they can expect of this culture, yet still feel empty and incapable of explaining why. They are incapable of blaming this culture and open themselves to the new, for they know nothing else but this morbid cultural world. They are socialized through and through by obsolete ideals and ideals. Material success is also tied to spiritual bankruptcy. Failure of culture at such a great scale forces the imagination to find explanations to why the more someone is successful in our society, the less is libidino investment is given back, given way to narcissism. This explains for Adorno why our current day culture finds such affinities with unconscious psychotic processes. These processes are the psychic attempt of culture at its own self-preservation. Schreber's case was an individualized case of narcissism and paranoia. He came up with his own narratives to overcome this anguish. But in a state of global, global cultural failure such as ours, a new phenomenon appears, which Adorno calls collective narcissism. I read a passage from Adorno's theory of pseudoculture. Collective narcissism amounts to this. People compensate for social powerlessness, which goes to the root of individual guilt feelings because they are not what they should be and do not what they should do according to their ideal self-image. They compensate by turning themselves either in fact or imagination into members of something higher and more encompassing to which they attribute qualities which they themselves lack and from which they profit by vicarious participation. Shared suffering promotes the appearance of collective narratives, allowing individuals to understand their suffering as something inscribed in a bigger whole, a nation, a people, an elite, a football team. 
sharing their culture and thus their suffering. This leads to conspiracy theories where mythical vile enemies must perish in order to restore the balance of the universe. Co collective narcissism allows the individual to alleviate his individual narcissism and project his suffering outside of himself, opening the way to collective narcissism and eventually collective paranoia. This explains why successful people in a failing culture like poor people and failing people in this culture, both give way to occult groups, conspiracy theories, and racism. The narcissist's gratification of leading a secret life and belonging to a select group exempts one from reality testing. It would be the palliative of a mind proudly content to see through the whole swindle. Collective narcissism provides schemata for coping with reality. These latter certainly do not approximate reality, but they compensate for the anxiety about what cannot be grasped. This suddenly explains why at the last American elections, Trump voters were to be found equally among poor and rich white people. People who even by investing what is the dominant culture of the entire world, feel persecution and threats to their being, whether it is actually the case or not, whether they are successful in this world or not. Max Orkheimer said this about this aspect of culture uh, here in the guise of European philosophical systems. The great systems of European philosophy as a, a representative of culture were always intended only for an educated upper crust and fit completely in the face of the psychic needs of the impoverished and socially continually sinking sections of the citizenry and peasantry, who are nevertheless completely tied to this form of society by upbringing, work, and hope, and cannot believe it to be transitory. However, in light of what we've said, we could go a step further than Orkheimer by saying that culture also fails to the psychic needs even of this educated upper crust. The true powerlessness our culture nourishes appear clearly, for example, in the COVID-19 crisis, where nobody, rich or people, knows what to do and how to cope with this, relying on paranoid narratives, implying conspiracies and the end of the world. We must expect that the more the gap between this morbid culture and the ever-changing historical reality is widening, the more such neuroses are to appear. We aim at finding the culprit, often imaginary, to explain what we feel as some sort of social decadence, which is nothing but the reflection of our internal psychic catastrophe. I shall conclude with an idea I'm exploring these days. There is something strong in the idea of collective narcissism, that is the idea of a collective. If this shared suffering could be turned in a collective critical subject capable of over overthrowing its dying culture to make place to a new one, maybe we could start to contemplate the idea of a new, more human world. Thank you. So thank you, Gabriel. So we will be entering the question uh, part of that uh, talk. Yeah, all, everyone should uh, go and put the clap reaction. Thank you. So <laughs> um, we will take uh, the questions uh, both in English or in French. So if you want uh, to uh, to say something, just tap in the chat that you want to uh, turn and uh, go ahead. Peut-être que moi-même, je peux commencer d'une question, en fait. Euh, J'aimerais avoir ton opinion sur qu'est-ce qui se passe, comment concevoir euh, des, les, des individus qui sont euh, privilégiés, puis qui ont l'air d'être plutôt schrébériens, je pense au cas de Kanye West, là, si, on, si on joue le jeu puis on, on veut le mettre là-dedans. Comment concevoir le fait que des individus euh, 
comme Kanye West, se retrouve en même temps au sommet de la, la production de culture. Euh, il y a une sorte de tension entre le fait de euh, mal rencontrer la frustration de mal saisir sa culture et d'en souffrir des conséquences psychiatriques, mais le cas apparaît un peu bizarre dans la situation où l'individu lui-même est un, un sommet genre de reconnaissance culturelle. Um, Est-ce que je réponds en français ou en anglais? Tu peux répondre en français ou en anglais. OK. Um, je, je, si, si, si ça vous va, je vais, je vais, je vais répondre en français sur celui-là parce que c'est une question assez, euh, assez pointue. Euh, L'ambiguïté ici, c'est sur l'enjeu de la production culturelle. C'est quelque chose qui préoccupait beaucoup Adorno, l'industrie culturelle. Mais si on prend, si on considère pas, si on considère Kanye West pas comme un, un représentant de l'industrie culturelle, mais comme un artiste, disons. Euh, il est intéressant chez Freud, par exemple, comment le travail artistique est vu comme euh, un travail justement de l'imagination à essayer de compenser pour une forme de souffrance. C'est-à-dire, il y a une fuite chez l'artiste du monde, euh, cas exemplaire, ce serait par exemple Baudelaire, qui tente justement de gérer cette anxiété, cette incapacité à expliquer son monde par une expression artistique. La question super intéressante que ça pose, et c'est une question qu'Adorno soulève dans sa théorie esthétique, c'est de savoir, est-ce qu'il est possible pour un artiste de pro produire quelque chose d'artistiquement pertinent sans pour autant être complètement névrosé? Est-ce que Baudelaire aurait pu écrire « Les fleurs du mal » sans être euh, déglingué? Puis est-ce que, euh, inversement, euh, on pourrait penser que quelqu'un qui n'est pas du tout équilibré est capable de quelque chose du genre? C'est une question euh, qui, qui, qui mérite exploration. Puis d'une certaine manière, ça, ça pointe vers une des faiblesses de la psychanalyse, c'est-à-dire sa tendance à psychiatriser et à tout mettre en termes de pathologie, euh, ce qui a tendance même des fois à servir l'ordre établi. C'est-à-dire que pour Freud, quelqu'un qui a de la misère à s'intégrer socialement et, et, et névrosé ou même psychotique est incapable de s'intégrer, pour lui, c'est un problème mental. D'une certaine manière, ça contribue à ce que la psychanalyse soit une théorie assez oppressante. Euh, ceci étant dit, qu'est-ce qui fait que... Euh, un artiste qui souffre de ce genre de, 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 de délire-là, euh, de, de, de souffrance-là, serait capable de se ramasser au sommet de, 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 de l'expression culturelle de son époque. Euh, une hypothèse que je donnerais, c'est, euh, j'ai dit tout à l'heure que la culture, ça devrait être un outil, euh, un moyen pour saisir et comprendre notre réalité. Il est possible à ce moment-là qu'une un, mise en mots adéquate de cette souffrance-là par un travail artistique puisse nous permettre de sympathiser par la catharsis à travers ce genre d'œuvres-là, puis de se reconnaître euh, dans ces œuvres-là. C'est-à-dire que des œuvres d'art, euh, aujourd'hui, qui arrivent à exprimer adéquatement les contradictions, les souffrances et les tensions de notre société, c'est quelque chose qui nous, dans lesquels on se reconnaît et on est content de se reconnaître, de se retrouver enfin. Donc, il est possible que ce genre de production-là soit intéressante. La preuve, c'est que, bien, on aime les histoires qui, 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 qui se passent bien, qui ont une fin heureuse, il y a quelque chose de soulageant là-dedans, mais il y a aussi une grande passion pour les œuvres tristes, tragiques, dramatiques. Euh, aussi, les, les œuvres comme, par exemple, les biopics qui nous montrent des personnages tragiques, un Kurt Cobain qui tombe justement dans, euh, éventuellement dans la dépression et s'enlève la vie. Il y, a, il y a quelque chose qui semble mettre à jour soudainement aux yeux de tous une souffrance qui est là et qui est vécue par, par tout le monde. Ce qui est intéressant, c'est que l'industrie culturelle est très forte à transformer cette expérience où on se reconnaît dans des phénomènes comme ça, comme outil de contrôle. C'est-à-dire, j'écoute un film triste en fin de soirée dans lequel je me suis reconnu, j'ai versé quelques larmes, je me sens mieux. Ça me rend plus capable de retourner au travail le lendemain. Euh, ce qui fait que comme dans un monde où justement la souffrance est telle, bien, on, on est prompt à se reconnaître dans ce genre dœuvre là Inversement, c'est sûr que comme... Il y a quelque chose d'intéressant. L'imagination aussi, faut-il le dire, l'imagination ne part pas d'une un, table rase. L'imagination récupère des éléments du réel et les agence d'une nouvelle manière et construit un univers fantasmé. J'ai dit un peu en exagérant que Schreiber avait construit son, son univers from scratch, mais en même temps, c'est faux. T'sais. Son rêve, c'est d'enfanter de, une nouvelle race arienne. Il n'a pas pris ça nulle part. Il a pris ça de sa société. 
Donc, dans le travail imaginatif, c'est d'abord un travail de reconfiguration d'éléments empiriques pris du réel dans un nouveau tout qui nous apparaît soudainement nouveau. Un artiste prend toujours quelque chose du réel et le réagence. Son travail, ce n'est pas un travail de génie qui crée ex nihilo, c'est la capacité de présenter le réel euh, sous une autre forme pour que s'exprime autrement le monde. Donc, ça serait des pistes de réponse que je donnerais pour euh, comment des gens se ramassent, euh, des gens qui souffrent de ce genre. Mais je ne sais pas à quel point, je ne m'acharnerai pas trop sur Kanye West. Il y, y a quelque chose du personnage aussi. Là. Euh, ça, faut-il le dire. Il y a quelque chose du, du, du génie torturé qui est hérité du romantisme qui est à l'œuvre là-dedans. Là. Donc, il euh, y a ça aussi qui est en jeu euh, dans tout ça. Je ne sais pas si j'ai répondu à ta question. Oui, c'est parfait. On a deux autres questions sur la liste. Donc, la première de Lena Zotoba. Would you think that a stronger sense of purpose, sometimes created by a strong religious background, is a protective factor to developing the conspirational uh, neurosis that you just described? Yeah, uh, yeah. On this, um, uh, uh, okay, religious is a um, is uh, a kind of an issue here. Uh, I, the the short answer would be yes, totally. Uh, in fact, it is probably the meaning of, uh, of Marx's famous sentence that is that religion is the opium of the people. It, it serves as a palliative that helps to bear the weight of social suffering. It's not for nothing that like um, Protestant life uh, aims at uh, like material asceticism. It is convenient where he, in context where you don't have any choice of such asceticism. It helps you to bear the weight of life and eventually uh, uh, cling to the promise that eventually everything would be, uh, all of this suffering will have a meaning in an eventual afterlife in a redemption. That I'm not saying that religion is neurotic, far from it. I'm saying that is, is, this is the kind of narrative, of social narratives that helps to cope with such social suffering. In fact, like when we quote Marx saying that like uh, religion is the opium of the people, it's usually used by some kind of uh, cheap uh, internet atheists as saying that we should get rid of religion. Whereas uh, what uh, Marx was meaning is that there is something good in religion. That is, as there is something good in opium, there's something satisfying that we seek, that we crave. And we should take this promise of religion and put it back on earth. That is the ideal of a good life where all your needs are satisfied and you're happy for the rest of eternity. That should not be a promise of the afterlife. That should be a promise of today. So we should, real, we should read religious narratives as Uh, a goal of social transformation, as Feuerbach was thinking, for example. So indeed, this kind of collective narrative helps to cope with such suffering. And in fact, it's maybe one of the most innocuous works of collective narcissism. That is here that these uh, project themselves in a very like armless way generally, that is until it gets po political and helps you just to like strengthen yourself Uh, to better cope with life. It's not, uh, it's not a coincidence if uh, in uh, anonymous alcoholics group, they have this super strong uh, religious uh, discourse. They even told, tell you that they don't care to what God you pray to. They just care that you put your life in the end of a stronger force outside of your control and that you submit to it. That helps them bear the weight of their, of their problems, of their issues. So yeah, totally, this kind of narrative helps to cope with uh, social suffering. So thank you for that answer. So we have uh, someone on the, the list for another question. So go ahead, Renaud. Oui, bonjour. Bon, Gabriel, d'abord, bravo pour la présentation. C'était très intéressant. Um, le point que, sur lequel euh, je voudrais peut-être que tu m'éclaires un peu, euh, je vais essayer de le mettre dans le mot des façons les plus, la plus claire possible. Au fond, euh, je trouve qu'il y a vraiment cet intérêt-là, justement, de, de parler de cette, cette, cet enjeu qui existe de pathologiser l'individu là où il y a des problèmes structurel, il y a des problèmes de, de, de société, de culture qui peuvent être identifiés. Euh, je me demande si, d'une certaine manière, en parlant de la pathologie de la culture, euh, 
on ne court pas aussi un peu de la même façon en se déplaçant de l'individu à la culture. On ne court pas un, un risque qui est un peu similaire, qui est la référence à une sorte de cadre transcendantal par lequel on évalue ce qui est de la pathologie de la, de la société, supposant donc qu'il existe ce cadre d'une société qui n'est qui pas pathologique. Donc, euh, je me demandais dans ce que ce, dans, face à cet enjeu-là, euh, si tu avais des, des, des si c'était un élément de considérer et si tu avais des pistes justement pour éviter de tomber un peu dans ce piège qu'on a parfois avec l'individu. Oui, merci pour la question. C'est un très bon point. Euh, il y a plusieurs pistes de réponse euh, là-dessus qui sont intéressantes. Euh, D'abord, euh, il n'est certainement pas question de, de construire quelque chose comme un, un cadre social transcendantal. Euh, si la société est quelque chose, c'est peut-être un quasi-transcendantal, mais pas un transcendantal. Je m'explique. La première chose, c'est que la, 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 la tentative de déplacer le questionnement de l'individu vers la société, c'est d'abord une tentative de s'éloigner euh, d'un type d'analyse, d'un type de moralité qui est, euh, que Adorno attribue à une certaine moralité bourgeoise, qui est celle de tout blâmer sur l'individu. De dire que s'il si souffre de maladie mentale, ben, c'est comme quelque chose qui a lien avec ben, ça sa complexion euh, naturelle, de son, son, son code génétique ou quoi que ce soit, de naturaliser l'enjeu, de le réduire à, à un truc aléatoire, alors qu'il vise quelque chose d'un peu plus systématique, de quelque chose d'un peu plus large, qui relève, qui enlève le poids de l'individu et qui le déplace là où la cause est véritablement. Ensuite, comment concevoir la société ici? Comme je l'ai mentionné, Adorno est un sociologue et euh, il le pose dans un texte qui s'appelle Société 1 comme une aporie. Et euh, il il démontre que la société, il est clair que la société est comme, existe à travers les individus qui la composent et seulement par là. Par ce fait, on peut se dire que, étant donné que la société n'existe que par des individus vivants, les individus vivants qui la composent peuvent potentiellement être capables de la saisir, de la comprendre. Néanmoins, on fait face à une autre, euh, à une autre idée euh, qui, est, euh, qui est abordée par Durkheim, je crois, c'est que d'abord, la société nous fait face comme une contrainte, comme quelque chose qui nous est étranger, euh, quelque chose qui nous fait face et qui est distinct de nous, dans lequel on ne se reconnaît pas. Donc là, on fait face à ce problème-là. Il semble qu'à la fois, on peut comprendre et ne pas comprendre la société. Adorno joue sur cette limite-là où il essaie de comprendre l'incompréhensible. Qu'est-ce qui fait que la société nous apparaît comme quelque chose d'externe, de tierce, euh, comme une entité qui nous est étrangère et aliénante. Donc, la société peut nous paraître transcendantale, mais il est possible de percer à jour cette apparence-là et de se la réapproprier par un travail critique. Euh, je le dis de la manière la plus optimiste et lumineuse possible, Adorno est beaucoup plus pessimiste que ça là-dessus. Ceci étant dit, euh, ce que ça veut dire, c'est qu'il y a une bonne partie de ce qu'on pourrait appeler l'objectivité sociale qui constitue la société qui échappe au sujet qui la constitue, aux individus. En ce sens, il y a quelque chose qui les forme, qui les forme littéralement, qui les construit, qui leur échappe, qui ne sont pas capables de comprendre parce qu'ils n'ont pas les outils théoriques et critiques nécessaires pour le faire. Ce n'est pas un blanc, ce n'est pas dire que les outils théoriques et critiques qu'il faut, c'est euh, le, le marxisme, je ne m'en vais pas là. C'est tout simplement de dire qu'il y a un élément social qu'on qu performe, qu'on crée, mais qui malgré nous nous échappe et qu'on n'est pas capable de rattraper. En ce sens-là, c'est pour ça qu'on va parler de pathologie sociale, parce qu'il y a un pendant objectif qui ne dépend pas juste de notre conscience, de notre bonne volonté, de notre intention. On sent qu'il y a quelque chose de cloche, mais on n'est pas bien capable de le saisir. C'est en ce sens-là que je parlerai de pathologie sociale, en ce sens que même si la société euh, n'existe qu'à travers ses individus, ça ne veut pas dire que la société est radicalement réductible à ces individus pour autant. Il peut y avoir une espèce de surplus, une espèce de, de quelque chose d'hétéronome qu'on n'est pas capable de bien saisir. Est-ce que ça répond à ta question? Oui, super, merci beaucoup. C'est très éclair. Hein? Ça fait plaisir. Euh, euh, oui. Euh, sinon... Uh, you have a question. Uh, there's a question in the, the chat after uh, I have a uh, raised hand in, in, in the Zoom. I can take this one after uh, the, the first. Uh, the question is, would you mind giving other examples of collective narcissism, which could alleviate human suffering and revive society's cultural fabric? Hmm. 
I don't know if the goal of collective narcissism is to alleviate, uh, is to revive society's cultural fabric. I think um, uh, this is actually you, 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 it aims di directly at like the, the the center of my thesis, and now I'm living anxiety right now. Um, uh, examples of collective narcissism. Would you have like spontaneously? Do you have an example in mind somewhere? Did you want to head to this so that I'd be sure that I answer correctly to where you're heading? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's just um, in the first question when we we talked about religious groups. Uh, yeah, yeah. That got me thinking. Yeah. Okay. I have I, I have a, a pretty clear example that I've just said. <laughs> I, 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 one is uh, an interesting one. The other one is super polemical. The first one would be um, simply um, a sports team. Uh, the way, for example, best example is like the, the, the Montreal Canadiens, which were a super strong collective narrative that helped French Canadians to cope with their social economical suffering by living through mythologized heroes like Maurice Richard or stuff like this. This is an example of like alleviating your individual suffering through something that's collective that helps like survive, survive and support something. That's why also like... Uh, <laughs> Uh, hockey fans tend to be passionate about it because there's something that it goes way beyond like people that says oh, it's just a sport why are you like crazy about this they don't understand the emotional implications of such investment uh the other <laughs> the other example would be nationalism N like, nationalist narratives in general like especially identity um the uh, nationalism, for, exa for example, <laughs> in Quebec, <laughs> are this kind of like collective narcissist narratives that can be justified. Like there is something in nationalism that aims at expressing, for example, social economical oppressions that must be recognized in elves for emancipation. But when it gets tied to like a specific mythologized history identity with heroes with like good and bad people uh this tends to go more in the like nar narcissistic like pathologic uh narrative i would say but um if you're triggered right now of my interpretation of uh, nationalism i'd say that nationalism is not reducible to collective narcissism uh i especially says that as a like easy way out but uh this is something we could uh, keep in mind when we are thinking about collective narratives that uh, amount to narcissism great thanks for the answer it really helps me um concretize this yeah you're welcome uh i have a question from a race and is uh zeal yeah oui bonjour um tout d'abord merci pour la présentation c'était fascinant Merci. Euh, là, là la, ça, la présentation, ça m'a fait mijoter, là j'ai des idées, puis là je, je me demande, c'est quoi votre avis sur euh, ce qu'on devrait faire comme, comme, jeune, euh, comme jeune médecin engagé, puis euh, possiblement ayant une influence sur la société comme clinicien, quel est votre conseil pour qu'on puisse euh, s'en sortir de, de notre situation culturelle pathologique? Oh, mon Dieu. <rire> um, Comme la... Je sais qu'on fait de la théorie critique, là, mais moi, je suis un gars d'action. Je veux, je veux faire oh, non, mais c'est parfait. C'est une excellente question. C'est une question qui doit être posée. Um, je, vais répondre... <rire> je vais répondre en philosophe, mais je pense, j'espère que ça va éclairer. Um, je ne sais pas jusqu'à quel point j'ai des pistes de réponses intéressantes pour des solutions, mais je dirais la priorité dans la vie, ce n'est pas tant de trouver des solutions que d'arrêter de faire partie du problème. Donc, <rire> Donc déjà... Il euh, faudrait être capable de faire un travail d'autocritique sur comment on investit nos pratiques et nos réflexions. Déjà, par exemple, de considérer que, euh, par exemple, euh, la pratique médicale est euh, imbriquée dans tout un contexte social qui a des objectifs clairs. Un idéal, par exemple, euh, un idéal de, 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 de sauver des vies à tout prix, c'est aussi, par exemple, parfois un idéal de sauver un travailleur, de le remettre sur pied pour qu'il soit productif pour le travail. Le simple fait aussi que des fois, par exemple, dans les soins palliatifs, euh, la mentalité complètement démente sur le plan logique économique, ce serait de dire « ah, oh, mais c'est pas rentable, ils vont mourir ». Ce genre d'espace-là, euh, 
il faut être capable de les thématiser comme pas juste des faits d'un sociopathe qui n'en a rien à faire, des gens qui meurent, mais comme justement l'expression de priorités sociales qui sont un peu décadentes. Donc, il faut être capable de voir, il euh, faut commencer à être sensible euh, à voir comment des fois, certains réflexes qu'on a, certaines attitudes, certains comportements qu'on a, visent d'abord à renforcer un statu quo, puis que par exemple, euh, le traitement à outrance, euh, l'espérance, le, le, euh, allonger l'espérance de vie, mais maintenir le décalage entre l'espérance de vie et l'espérance de vie en santé, tout simplement parce qu'on a un idéal de garder des gens en vie et surtout de les garder productifs, d'explorer ces tensions-là, ces contradictions-là, puis de se poser des questions là-dessus, ça serait déjà une première étape. Par la suite, je ne me risquerai pas en tant que philosophe d'être prescriptif, surtout sur un plan social-politique. Euh, J'essaierai plus de dire, euh, soyons alertes aux contradictions qui sont sociales, puis savoir par exemple que de médicamenter euh, quelqu'un qui est en dépression, le but premier, ce n'est pas que cette personne-là soit plus heureuse, c'est de la rendre productive. Puis que ça, à ce moment-là, il y a une contradiction entre le bonheur d'une personne et sa société, puis que cette contradiction-là devrait être explorée dans un cadre plus large qui dépasse largement la pratique que, 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 que vous êtes appelé à, à faire. Et donc, finalement, on ne peut pas espérer par des actions isolées, réformistes, localisées, changer véritablement les choses. Ça implique une démarche de réflexion plus large. Puis il y a quelque chose, en fait, même de de potentiellement nuisible parce que tu sais, on vit tous une sorte de dissonance, une sorte de, de souffrance en se disant « je veux aider, je veux faire une différence ». Puis ça nous rend prompt à s'embarquer dans des solutions, des fausses bonnes idées, euh, de la pseudo-activité où on, on veut juste se convaincre de faire quelque chose. Un exemple tout banal, on se dit « l'environnement est en train de foutre le camp, on se sent mal, mais genre, je re... à chaque fois que je mets un petit quelque chose dans le recyclage, j'ai l'impression que je fais quelque chose et que je change les choses alors que ce n'est pas le cas ». Donc, pas se laisser avoir par des fausses bonnes idées, euh, rester alerte de savoir que finalement, des, il y a quelque chose de toujours plus qui va par-delà l'individu et qui s'implique dans un contexte plus large, puis de voir comment notre, notre pratique sociale, des fois, au lieu d'aider à ce que les gens soient mieux, renforce surtout un statu quo qui est justement ce qui les rend malades. Tu sais. C'est ce que j'aurais à dire, c'est peut-être un peu trop abstrait, philosophique, mais ça serait une piste de réponse. Merci beaucoup. Je pense que c'est vrai, c'est ce un, un peu les mêmes pensées que j'ai au quotidien, mais en moins, moins éloquent. <rire> je ne je, je, je prétendrai pas avoir, avoir l'éloquence que vous m'attribuez, mais c est, c est, c est, tant mieux si c'est le genre de réflexe qu'on a, parce que c'est à quoi il faut être sensible. Merci pour votre question. Donc, euh, j'ai un peu suivi euh, le geste de Zio, puis je vais te remercier. Puis euh, je pense que tout le monde euh, ici euh, te remercie, euh, Gabriel, pour cette superbe présentation. So, thank you again for uh, this really, really nice presentation. We went from uh, Schreber to Freud to the Canadien de Montréal. That was uh, pretty nice. So, um, again, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we'll try to keep more events like this in the future. And uh, thank you again, Gabriel. Thanks you. Merci beaucoup.